last video I made, I was talking about the times of King Ahaz in the Old Testament, who was the King of Judah, the southern part of what we now call Israel. And he was at war with the northern part of Israel, and they were lined up with Syria to attack Judah. And it was a terrifying time for King Ahaz. King Ahaz was an ungodly man and had done some terrible uh, things, and even burning his own son in the fire. And the Philistines took advantage of the trouble Judah was in, and they started looting the Jews. And so King Ahaz turned to the most powerful kingdom in the world at that time, the Assyrians, to help them. He effectively bought their help with treasures that he'd given to them from his own palace and from the house of God. And so the Assyrians beat Israel and they beat Syria, but then they turned on Judah and made Judah really just a, a puppet state where the Assyrians were really calling the shots. Last time we looked at the story and drew some lessons from it and thought about what God said in his promises to the people of Judah. Today, I want to think about what God said through Isaiah to the various nations that were coming against Israel at that time for our encouragement. So we're going to start reading in the book of Isaiah, chapter 17 and verse 4. And in that day the glory of Jacob will be brought low, and the fat of his flesh will grow lean. And it shall be as when the reaper gathers standing grain, and his arm harvests the ears, and as when one gleans the ears of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Gleanings will be left in it, as when an olive tree is beaten, two or three berries in the top of the highest bough, four or five on the branches of a fruit tree, declares the Lord God of Israel. In that day, man will look to his maker, and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, and he will not look on what his own fingers have made, either the Asherim or the altars of incense. In that day, their strong cities will be like the deserted places of the wooded heights, and the hilltops which they deserted because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. These words were addressed to the northern kingdom of Israel that was attacking Judah. And the Lord's message was clear. The strongholds, the fortresses that you are trusting in will disappear. These places had been built on the high places where the Canaanites, driven out centuries ago in front of the Israelites, had built their altars for worship. And the Lord had driven them out because of their sin. And now he was going to do the same to the people of Israel who are worshipping idols there. Their glory was going to be brought low. I wonder what you glory in that isn't of God. There may be things that we make our identity out of and we make them our glory. And they're the things that we post on Facebook and they're the things that we want people to see. And we're glorying in those things instead of God. Well, the Israelites had gloried in their strongholds, but their glory was going to be brought low. The people would be decimated. They would suffer poverty where there had been prosperity. It says the fat of their flesh will grow lean. Maybe some of you would like that. It would save you dieting. But really, this was a serious um, punishment that was coming upon them. Their prosperity was going to disappear. And they'd be decimated in terms of their population. It would be like gleaning time, when the olive tree is shaken and the olives have come off it and there's maybe just one or two at the top branches that people haven't reached and they're all that's left on the olive tree. Or at gleaning time in the field, where the harvest has been and there's just a few things to gather at the edge of the field. That's what would be left of Israel. And what was the reason for this punishment? Well, we read it in verse 10, you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. 
I wonder if our society can relate to these things. Have we forgotten God? Listen to those two lovely titles in that verse for God. The God of your salvation. He's the one who saves us, and it cost him his own son to do it. He gives us relief from the dread of punishment, and he gives us power to live differently. He gives us a hope of a different world to come. He's the God of our salvation. And he's also called the rock of your refuge. Well, you know what a refuge is. It's a safe place that you can run away to. The castles that give the best defence are built on a rock. The enemy can't get in. God wants to be our safe place that we can run to in time of trouble. Have we forgotten God, our salvation? Have we forgotten the rock of our refuge? Or are we running to hide ourselves in him? The hymn writer said, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. What would be the result when God had done these things to Israel? It says, in that day, man will look to his maker and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. They wouldn't look to their idols anymore. They wouldn't look to their own solutions to their problems, but they'd look to God, their maker. Wouldn't that be wonderful if in the turmoil that we're going through now, people stopped looking to the solutions they normally seek, but lifted their eyes to heaven to look to God, our maker. Well, the prophecy was fulfilled. The Assyrians would come against Israel and eventually, not too many decades hence, the Assyrians would take that northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes, captive and they'd disappear out of history. But let's make sure that we lift our eyes to the God of our salvation, to the rock of our refuge. So that's what he said to Israel. What did he say to their ally, Syria? Well, we read about that in the first three verses of Isaiah 17. An oracle concerning Damascus. Damascus was the capital of Syria, where King Rezin of the Syrians had his throne. Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aroah are deserted. They will be for flocks which will lie down and none will make them afraid. The fortress will disappear from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria will be like the glory of the children of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Be a heap of ruins, no longer a kingdom. There'd just be a remnant left. Their glory would be like the glory of the children of Israel. And we've just heard, haven't we, that their glory was brought low. Well, the prophecy was soon fulfilled. We read in 2 Kings 16 and 9, And the king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it, carrying its people captive to Ker, and he killed Rezin, who you'll remember was the king of Syria. See, when God says a thing, he does it. And the prophecies of the glorious things to come that are mentioned in the New Testament, those things will happen just as surely. And what about the Philistines who were raiding Israel? For that, we need to turn to chapter 14 and verse 29. In the year that King Ahaz died came this oracle. Rejoice not, O Philistia, all of you, that the rod that struck you is broken. For from the serpent's root will come forth an adder, and its fruit will be a flying, fiery serpent. And the firstborn of the poor will graze, and the needy lie down in safety. But I will kill your root with famine, and your remnant it will slay. Wail, O gate, cry out, O city, melt in fear, O Philistia, all of you. For smoke comes out of the north, and there is no straggler in his ranks. The Philistines were glad to see Judah be in fear 
And the reason for that was that Judah had kept them under, right from the days of David on. Ahaz's grandfather was Uzziah, and he'd won great victories over the Philistines. And he's pictured here like a rod, and Judah is pictured like a serpent, exerting power over the Philistines. But now it says the rod was broken. But they weren't to rejoice. They weren't to celebrate because of that, because an adder would come from the serpent's root. Judah would again have a ruler that would bring Israel's enemies into subjection. And it says a powerful army would come from the north like smoke. It would be a relentless army. There'd be no straggler in its ranks. All the soldiers would be determined to do this job of crushing the Philistines. And sure enough, we read that the Assyrians defeated Israel and Syria and they broke the power of the Philistines too. Now notice in what we read, who benefits from the disappearance of the Philistines from Judah? It says, the firstborn of the poor will graze and the needy will lie down in safety. God has a special care for the poor and needy. The politicians neglect them, the planners neglect them, but we shouldn't. We should give them special honour and attention, as the Lord Jesus did. They'd suffered in the Philistines' raids, more than the rich perhaps, but now they're pictured like a flock of sheep lying down in safety, grazing. God wants us to be fed both physically and not neglecting to feed ourselves spiritually. He wants us to be able to lie down in safety, to enjoy times of peace from our spiritual enemies so that we can grow and make progress. Then in the next verse, the Philistines are pictured sending a messenger to Judah. What will one answer the messengers of the nation? The Lord has founded Zion and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. The Philistines sent their messengers to find out what was going on and the answer comes back, the Lord has founded Zion and in her the afflicted of his people find refuge. God had chosen Jerusalem to be the place where his name lived. His name was associated with that city. His house, the temple, was built there and he'd established it as a safe place despite all the wickedness of King Ahaz. God was their refuge and the people would find safety in the place of his name. Yes, those who plundered Israel would be scattered. And in verses 13 and 14, it says this, the nations roar like the roaring of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away. Chased like chaff on the mountains before the wind, and whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, behold, terror. Before morning, they are no more. This is the portion of those who loot us, and the lot of those who plunder us. You've maybe all seen film of tornadoes, and the dust caught up, scattered in that whirling wind. You and I have spiritual enemies. Flesh and blood people aren't our enemies directly. They can harm us, they can want to stop the spread of the gospel and the truth. But they're empowered and motivated by unseen spiritual enemies. And the Lord has destroyed their power over us at the cross. And one day he'll remove their influence totally from the world. That will be a great time. Those who want to raid us of our peace of mind, those who want to steal our obedience and tempt us to throw away our confidence and turn to other things instead of the Lord, the devil and his servants, they chip away at us, raiding us of our peace of mind. But they have no power to take us to the place that's reserved for them. They can't make us do evil. If we don't let them, the Lord will one day rebuke them and he'll scatter.
scatter them like the dust in the whirlwind. That's how God deals with our enemies. So finally, what about Assyria? We've thought about what God said to Israel and Syria and the Philistines, and they turned to Assyria to help them, and instead of helping them, really, Assyria oppressed them again. So what did God have to say to them? Well, this time, we're still on Isaiah 14, and I'm reading from verses 24 to 27. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, and on my mountain trample him underfoot, and his yoke shall depart from them, and his burden from their shoulder. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth, and this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Powerful words, aren't they? The Assyrians would be broken. They wouldn't be allowed to dominate God's land anymore. Their yoke would be depart. The burden they had imposed on the Israelites, the Jews would be removed. And linking it back to our spiritual enemy, we don't have to be in bondage and slavery to sin anymore because the Lord has released us. The Lord had sworn, it says the Lord had planned, the Lord had purposed. He was definitely going to do this. And looking at our world today, it may comfort you to be reminded through these scriptures that the Lord has a plan. The things that he's sworn to do, he's done them and he'll do the rest of them. The things he's planned and he's purposed for the future will come to pass. And after those plans for Assyria are revealed, in what we read, the camera panned back to see the whole of history affecting all the nations of the earth, including what God will yet do in the future. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. Someday soon, the Lord Jesus will return and he'll take those who believe in him to be with himself. We'll be caught up with those who have gone before us and will be with Christ. And things down here will go from bad to worse as they follow a man that the Bible describes as Antichrist. He'll be anti-Christian in all of his thinking and ideas, but the world will think he has all the answers and the nations of the world will ally themselves to him and they'll follow him. And they'll gang up on Jerusalem once more, that city that we've been thinking about. But the Lord will return with all his saints and he'll overcome the powers of evil ultimately and forever. And he'll set up his throne in that city of Jerusalem. And having judged the nations, the living nations at that time, he will reign. He will reign over this earth for a thousand years. And then after that, there'll be the final judgment and a new heaven and a new earth. How can you do justice to these things in a 15 minute video? But I just want to give you a flavour of what glorious plans the Lord has. And the words that we've read are applicable to it. The Lord of hosts has purposed and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? No one can turn back his hand. He will act. The circumstances we can see around us may seem overwhelming, as they must have done to the Jews in the time of King Ahaz. But God has his plan. And he is in control. Thank you for listening.